welcome to one and all for this memorial service in witness to the resurrection and thanksgiving for the life of Krista Alice Nix Golden. Child of God, child of the covenant, she was one of the pillars in this church. She would not have liked my saying that, I don't think, would she? <laughs> but she was. And, um, and now we celebrate her life as being part of the cloud of witnesses that cheers us on as we run the race of faith. The memories of her life, the stories animate us and will continue to animate us throughout our days. Um, you know, saints are those who have lived and who lived and who have passed away. And there is an ancient uh, commentary on the notion of saints in the Apostles' Creed the communion of saints that suggests that God will not be left without a witness on this world and there will always be saints. And in that ancient witness, we're talking about fourth century Christian witness, um, it even identified uh, folk who are uh, not Christian as saints. It's a remarkable thing to think about. And it is that generosity of spirit of the notion of who a saint is that I think uh, Chris embodied in her life as a generous, generous person with love, with compassion, with all that she is. And we will remember her, remembrances will be offered. But primarily, this is a worship service in witness to God who is resurrection and life. A witness to a God for whom death is not the last word, but simply a transition to another life. Now to be sure we grieve, but it is also important that we bear witness to the reality of a life that is with us now, will always be with us, and that is the life of God. And as Chris is held in the life of God, she is too with us at all times and all places. As the call to worship, I have often offered uh, John Calvin's favorite, which comes from Psalm 121. Um, the psalmist was looking to the hills and seeing enemies all about, and then said, as I look to the hills, from whence does my help come? It comes from the God of heaven and earth, so that let, let us rejoice and be glad because God's salvation is present to us at every moment in time. Let us join together in prayer. O God who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Show us now your grace that as we face the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days are ended, enable us to die as those who go forth to live so that living or dying our life may be in Jesus Christ our Lord. And the people said, Amen. Our opening hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 12 in your red hymnal.
Please be seated. I have the privilege of reading two scriptures from the Old Testament. The first is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The second reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to heal, and a time to kill. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord. It is also my privilege to read a few quotations that Wilson shared that Chris loved. This first one is by Peyton C. March, general from, who lived from 1864 to 1953. There is a wonderful mythical law of nature that the three things we crave most in life, happiness, freedom, and peace of mind, are always attained by giving them to someone else. Next one is by Scott Peck. He's a psychiatrist and author who lived from 1936 to 2005. The truth is that our finest moments are most likely to occur when we're feeling deeply uncomfortable, unhappy, or unfulfilled. For it is only in such moments propelled by our discomfort that we are likely to step out of our ruts and start searching for different ways or truer answers. St. Teresa's Prayer. May today there be peace within. May you trust God that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May you use those gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content knowing that you are a child of God. Let this presence settle into your bones and allow the soul the freedom to sing, dance, praise, and love for it is there for each and every one of us. 
And finally, by Joss Whedon, a writer and film director who was born in 1964. All I ask is this, do something, try something. Speaking out, showing up, writing a letter, a check, a strongly worded email. Pick a cause, there are few unworthy ones. And nudge yourself past the brink of tacit support to action. Once a month, once a year, or just once. And Roger will have the last one. Thank you. And now we have two remembrances of dear friends of Chris, Karen Dunlap and Paul Dornan, and then a reading from daughter Wesley. It's Karen. I'm Karen, and I'm a member of this congregation. I usually don't speak in public, only sometimes to four and five-year-olds, but I'm honored to be asked to share my memories of Chris. I'm sure that many of you have seen this picture, which appears in random places on the New York Avenue website. It's a picture of Chris and Wilson worshiping here on either side of two of their grandchildren. I'm not sure if the very familiar smile on Chris's face is she is responding to the sermon or because two of their many grandchildren are sitting between them. But it's the picture I have gone back to several times this week and it's how I will always remember Chris. In honor of Chris today, I am wearing my wedding dress, not the one I wore when I married Tom, but the one I pull out when I help with weddings. Chris and I bonded years ago when we shared a little known volunteer job here, that of wedding liaison, a job that entails coordinating the needs of the couple getting married with the staff here at church. In some ways, 
this dress reminds me a little of Chris. It has to be comfortable enough to run around the church and coordinate all the activity, but appropriate enough to blend in. I think of Chris as someone who always worked the hardest, but never called attention to herself. When we were thinking about Chris recently, Tom reminded me that after a particularly busy book sale, he came home and told me that Wilson did all the talking, but Chris did all the work. <laughs> but thank goodness that Wilson did talk so much because he was determined to talk our congregation into funding and creating this beautiful space for worship. As wedding liaisons, Chris and I enjoyed welcoming visitors to the sanctuary and seeing their admiration for our sacred space. Working with people getting ready for a wedding can be stressful, but Chris always rose to the occasion. Sometimes even being asked at the last minute to run the rehearsal, she did everything with calmness and grace. Sometimes it was necessary to say no to the bridal couple, like, no, we can't move the baptismal fount. <laughs> or one time when Chris had to tell a room full of groomsmen with flasks that the church had a no alcohol policy. But the time I remember the most is when we had two weddings that were scheduled a little too closely together. Chris was in charge of the first one which began late. I was in charge of the second one, and the florist arrived as the speaker was still speaking from the Eagle Lectern. Chris stood in the back of the church and waved her arms, trying very hard to get the speaker's attention and managed to usher all the guests out in time for the second wedding. We had the opportunity to share many retreats together, and I think Chris especially liked the women's retreats. It was at one of our earliest retreats during Get Acquainted Games that Chris surprised us all with her little known fact that she and Wilson met as a groupie for his band. As a couple, Chris and Wilson served this church in so many, many ways. I remember that sometimes on particularly busy weekends, they would stay in town rather than travel back and forth to Virginia. I always thought it was a great way, that, great that they found a way to combine their service with spending time enjoying the city together. But beyond my memories of Chris's friendship to me, I want to keep alive the memories of Chris's gifts to our community. Do I have any water? Um, no? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So I turn to Francis Gensch to fill my memory of to fill my memory of Chris's role in an important event in the life of our church. Francis told me, there's no question that Chris found her vocation in ministry in the role of deaconess, a board of the church on which she both served and eventually led. Her work on this board was distinguished by such depth of caring for members and friends of this congregation who were sick and in need of special care. Chris recognized that this ministry of caring and visitation should not be gender specific and that it was hard to recruit men to a board of deaconesses. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Harder than I thought. <laughs> uh -huh. And so Chris recognized that it should not be just women only. Also, the name of the board did not reflect the reality that by the 21st century, a few brave men had actually joined their number and were serving New York Avenue as deaconesses. So in 2010, 61 years later after the founding of this board, Chris facilitated a much needed and long overdue shift in the name to reflect a more inclusive ministry and one more in sync with biblical and church tradition. It was renamed the Board of Diaconal Ministers and given ordained status as a distinct part of the congregation's diaconate. And I know there are many diaconal ministers here who serve us all. And we're all grateful to Chris Golden because if it weren't for her, men who have gifts for this important ministry and this calling in the life of our church would no doubt still be serving as deaconesses. When I was remembering Chris with others, 
The word I heard over and over again was nice, but probably what we really recognized was her kindness, which some might attribute to her southern charm and grace. But as Roger and Galatians remind us, kindness is a fruit of the spirit, one that Chris had in abundance and lived her life and all her actions with others. And so I want to share this quote from Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I suspect none of us will ever forget her kindness and how it made us feel. Thank you. Good afternoon. John F. Kennedy once described Washington, D.C., not particularly kindly, as a city of southern efficiency and northern charm. <laughs> he was probably right. As I think back to the coming of the Goldens to this church community about 16 years ago, Chris and Wilson infused a sudden rush of Southern charm and oddly Northern efficiency to our life together. <laughs> the word that keeps coming back to me as I think about Chris is graciousness. She was gracious all over. Friendly, unassuming, good at listening, willing to express an opinion but also reluctant to offend. Sounds like the definition of a diaconal minister the name we give to the church board charged with caring for the sick and the homebound. And Chris ably served in that august capacity for many years. At least in my experience, Chris and Wilson were a real pair. Some wag has said that second marriages mark the triumph of hope over experience. Yet it was evident from our first encounters and throughout our friendship that these two people truly loved each other. They could figure out a way to root their hearts out for LSU and Old Miss respectively, and yet remain together. <laughs> they could sit in the car together for thousands upon thousands of miles and still end up in the same place. They could accommodate each other's passions. For example, did a conversation with Wilson ever not include some reference to politics? I couldn't really figure out whether Chris truly wanted to be out on the hustings near the end of every campaign, but she stood by her man in the best sense of the term. Chris loved her family, her sisters and brother, her children, and especially starred her grandchildren. All you had to do was ask her, and a kind of dreamy look came into her eyes. And then she would bring out her cell phone and show you the most recent pictures. Some of us who have been around New York Avenue Church for many years can't fully understand how those of us who we've loved could ever possibly leave us. And yet they do. It was so clear that Chris and Wilson, but especially Chris, wanted to be in the very midst of their children and grandchildren. So we reluctantly, almost willingly, accepted their departure. Wilson and Chris were a member of our Saturday evening study group. We met Saturday evening a month, one Saturday evening a month at one of our houses for dinner, talk, and discussion of the book we had all agreed to read for that month. Now, there are two kinds of book group members, those who read every book and those who read every book they want to read. <laughs> Chris and Wilson were definitely of the first variety, although they occasionally read their books on tape. I remember vividly one evening we finally sat down to discuss the book and Chris and Wilson started in some detail to describe very strangely the book they had read. 
The rest of us started making furtive glances at one another. Finally, one of us had the temerity to ask exactly what book they had read. Wilson pulled it out. The paperback had the very same title as the, uh, as the one the rest of us had read. Unfortunately, it was a completely different book. I would recommend occasional reading of different books with the same title to add a spice to our future book discussions. I would claim that all the cooks in our study group are superlative, none more so than Chris. We had many tasty, wonderfully tasty meals in Falls Church. I recall one in particular. Chris's sister was there and they had decided to build the main course around grits. Now, I would say that grits is an acquired taste, particularly for us Yankees, and I wouldn't actually say I have acquired it. <laughs> but I smiled through gritted teeth, get the grit, and dug in, and the grits were actually quite palatable. I wouldn't exactly say that I dived in for seconds, but Chris made it into a lovely meal, served with love. I know this is a very hard time for many of those who loved Chris, but my last words are especially for Wilson. <laughs> For, for a long time after our son died, to paraphrase an old hymn, I kept asking myself the questions, would my pain no respite No, would my tears forever flow? It seemed as if the sorrow would never cease. And then I would ask myself another question, when the pain does go away, will my memory of Andrew go with it? I can assure you, Wilson, that the pain does not entirely go away, but it does recede. And the memories remain vivid, strong, life-giving. You'll never lose Chris. Somehow, at some point, the ongoing gift of life will strengthen in you. And I happen to believe those gifts of life and powerful memory are gifts of a loving and suffering God. Thank you. Death is nothing at all. I have only slipped away into the next room. I am I and you are you. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. Call me by my old familiar name and speak to me in the easy way you always used. Put no difference into your tone and wear no air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me as it always was. There is unbroken continuity I am but waiting for you, somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well. Our next hymn is hymn number 20, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Please stand for this hymn.
Please be seated. And now a reading from Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. It is said uh, that Matthew 5 kind of summarizes the entirety of the ministry of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. And uh, I'm sure that this passage was picked because it summarizes the ministry of Chris Golden. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came. And they, he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Before I read the Matthew, uh, I mean the Romans text, um, I do want to read the final reading that uh, was one of Chris's favorites. Hannah Sanish, I think that's the way you, you pronounce her name, poet, playwright, paratrooper. Uh, her dates are 1921 to 1944. There are stars whose radiance is visible on earth, though they have been long extinct. There are people whose brilliance continues to light the world, though they are no longer among the living. These lights are particularly bright when the night is dark. They light the way for humankind. I must make a confession. Um, I guess I'm old enough in my ministry. I've made this confession privately to some. But um, there's a point at which I have grown to hate weddings. <laughs> I, I'm, I, and, I, and I apologize. I'm looking out at the crowd, and I'm seeing several for whom I've officiated. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about your marriage, Tara. <laughs> Your wedding was wonderful, and I love doing it. <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was my former church, and um, I didn't have any wedding coordinators. And I had to uh, do the uh, choreography, the production, the direction, and then act in the play. And it was incredibly stressful. And then on the occasion when I would have a wedding coordinator, they were awful, and I'd have to tell them to get out of the way. So when I came to New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, and I heard that we had wedding coordinators, I thought, oh no. <laughs> but then I, then I uh, found out who the wedding coordinators were, and, and, and Chris Golden and, and Karen Dunlap, and they truly are, are, are wonderful. They made weddings a joy. They would, they would take care of, uh, of all the, the bride and the bridesmaids and they would get them to the back of the sanctuary and then they would come and report that everything's ready to go and I would be very relaxed and I would think, okay, let's do it. And it was just truly wonderful. But I mean, they, they had to attend to a lot of things, especially weddings that didn't that, that, that I didn't do, or Alice wouldn't do, or Tara didn't do, right? right? They would have to attend to a lot of the weddings that would happen here at the church, and there was not always an easy thing to do, by the way. This was not easy to be a wedding coordinator, and I remember this one wedding. It was a friend who called me up, a minister friend, who had a minister friend who was the friend of the groom. They were fraternity brothers, right? Now, that should have been the first signal right? 
So this friend, who was a dear friend of mine, a minister friend, really pushed me, and I said, they really want to do the wedding at New York Avenue. I said, okay, they can do it. It was a pain in the neck. I didn't have to do the wedding. This friend this, didn't have to do the wedding. It was a pain in the neck. All the details were, they, they were nitpicking at all this stuff, and they were, they were reneging on having to pay for the wedding and complaining about paying for the wedding. And I had to get involved in stuff that I didn't want to get involved in in any way, shape, or form. And then the wedding finally took place, and I guess it came off without a hitch. It must have. And I showed up the next morning, Sunday morning, for worship, walked into my office, and there was an empty bottle of scotch in the trash can. I mean, we're not talking just a little bit empty. I mean, it was, just, it was emptied. I mean, I picked it up and put it aside, and there was nothing in this bottle of scotch. And it was, and it was not a very good bottle of scotch, by the way. <laughs> and I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> It was, it was a lousy bottle of scotch. The point being, there was only one point to this scotch, right? <laughs> they were really preceding, shall we say, the reception. Uh, and we do have a wedding policy against these kinds of things. Um, and you could argue that, you know, there were five groomsmen and there was a minister. And so between them, they actually didn't drink that much or something like that. But Lord... How would you like to be the wedding coordinator for that wedding? I tell that story to say that being a wedding coordinator was a tough job. And I was always grateful to hear that Chris Golden, when every time we had a wedding and I wasn't a part of it, or was a part of it, that Chris or Karen um, were doing it because I knew it would be done right. And I know that they would um, oversee the church and the best interest in the church. And that they would see that uh, weddings are done with dignity. I will tell you that after that experience of the scotch bottle, I have included sobriety in my opening comments at a wedding. <laughs> right? Right? But there's more to Chris, obviously. Um, Karen has already told you about her work with the uh, deaconesses, the diaconal ministers, and uh, I, know I, I, can, I know I can speak for Alice, and I know I can speak for Tara, that over the years, Tara Spooler McCabe, by the way, who was a minister here for 10 years, is here, and I know over the years, um, they have made the work of pastoral ministry here uh, a joy. They have... Uh, I don't think the work of pastoral ministry is ever easy, but they have, um, I can't tell you what it means. Um, I, I told, I, I need to preface this with something. The, these flowers, uh, when we're done here, will be put in, um, uh, I guess you'd call it coffee cans, right, that are decorated, and they'll be put in there, and they'll be taken out to people who are in the hospital, um, who we're caring for, who we know about, and they're a sign of love from this congregation. And on, on, the, on the sign of it, on, on, on the little tag on it, it says that these, uh, these flowers bless the worship service at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. So it's an extension of the congregation. It's an extension of worship. But it's an extension of the love of this congregation. And um, Chris oversaw that with such wonder and life. And I cannot tell you how important it was for me to go into a hospital room and see one of those canisters already sitting there. Especially if the flowers were all, 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 almost dead because I knew they had, they had they'd gotten there like four or five days. Per, you know, they'd been there four or five days. And, and um, that, is an, that, that, is a, that is a blessing that um, it's, it's hard to express how important that is and how important Chris was to that ministry here at this church. So let me just say a few words. I, f I feel like it's always my job at services like this to say a few theological words about why we're here and what we're doing. And because I know that Chris sat through a whole bunch of these services, I'm gonna say something a little 
different this time. There is a um, wonderful theologian um, who we're going to get here at New York Avenue by the name of Shelley Rambo. Has done some wonderful work on trauma. Um, and the gist of it is, is, is kind of this. I think it's important to say these things on this occasion. That there are some people, because of grief, because of trauma, because of this or that and experience, that get stuck between Good Friday and Easter. They get stuck in Holy Saturday. When I read her, her, her work, I realized that that, that could describe a lot of us. Um, one of the other things that I'm having to confess in my um, elder statesmanship here is that I don't always like Easter. Because Easter is, is so flowery and so exuberant, and it should be in some ways. But you know, some of us aren't ready. Some of us aren't there. And that's the truth. And what Shelley Rambo is trying to get at is a Holy Saturday faith that we just need to acknowledge. It's a powerful acknowledgement of the fact that uh, people remain in a certain place because of grief, loss, varieties of experiences they have in life that don't allow them to completely celebrate um, resurrection and life. So in a second book that I just got through, um, she extends the thesis in, in a very interesting way, drawing on the resurrection appearances of Jesus in John's gospel in a locked room where the disciples are. He appears to them, wounds and all. Wounds and all. It's a remarkable scene. Go, go and read it sometime. All of the wounds of crucifixion are right there for the disciple. And it, it's, in that, it's in that scene that Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit. It's the resurrection scene, by the way. And so I, I'm telling you this to kind of, it's a different way of thinking about Easter that's really helping me a lot. And it's a different way of thinking about Doubting Thomas. This is the story of Doubting Thomas. Now, you remember what, what Doubting Thomas was not there the first time Jesus appears to them. And, and um, so the disciples tell Doubting Thomas about the resurrected Christ. And do you remember what the Doubting Thomas says? I don't think he's so doubting here, by the way. You remember what he says? He doesn't say, unless I see his crown. No, he says, unless I see the wounds. And so, what Shelley Rambo does with that is this, that actually resurrection, Easter is attending to the wounds, is not erasing them, not submerging them. It's attending to those broken places. And perhaps, that's what Easter's about. It's acknowledging that we all bear wounds. We have all had losses for which there is not much consolation. We've all had trauma. What the resurrected Christ is inviting us as disciples to do is to attend to them on the promise that God is with us. And so, I always like to read in a funeral, a memorial service, these remarkable words from the Apostle Paul, who I think is saying, in essence, the same thing. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his only son, 
that gave him up for us all, will not he also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of those who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. And especially, we thank you for your servant, Chris. Whom you have now received into your presence. Help us to believe where we have not seen. Trusting you to lead us through our years and bring us at last with your saints into the joy of your home. And let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our concluding hymn is hymn number 69. I, the Lord of land and sea.
after the benediction, you are all invited to the Peter Marshall Hall, um, which is on the fifth floor. If you're hardy, you can walk up. I encourage you to do that. It's good for you. Uh, there are elevators that can take you up. Receive now this benediction. Go in peace, and may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working among us, which is pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ, to whom glory and honor are forever and ever. And the people said, Amen. Amen.